This is the sound of the Killer Keller beatbox body part sample pack. Over 120 loops, samples, and one shots for your music production. Exclusively on Splice. Killer Keller podcast. Killer Keller official <laughs> Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller podcast. That's oh, pretty scary, though. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're cracking one open. This is the Killer Keller podcast, live and direct central London. Um, Port Pie Hat, DJ Plastician inside the place. How are we doing? I'm good. I'm good. We're just talking about the simplicity of technology. Today. Yeah, yeah. You guys are uh, doing a, a good service to the simplicity vibe right now with the... <laughs> yeah. The mics, the, the nice home setup. I like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it's makeshift. It's it's haberdashery chic. I like it. I like it. It works. It definitely does. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it does. And I, what I like about the whole setup is uh, I'm I'm often taken back by the kind of level of artistry like yourself that is like totally up for it. But but the the macro version, the kind of makeshift of it all, like, I, I really I really get off on that. Do you yeah, know man. I mean? It's good. It's like accessible for everyone now, isn't it? So uh, mm. it's always nice to see uh, what people do with the imagination and the tech that is sure. available to all. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And that's kind of where you... Whereas artistry or a lot of kind of the more upstart kind of music nowadays, it, well, I say nowadays, it's always been like that. It's been like the simplest ways to get the best job you can done. Exactly, yeah. yeah exactly, yeah. just finding... Finding the quickest route to the result at the end, of, at the end, really, yeah. and just yeah, getting better at it yeah. and practicing the, the craft, really. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you've been in that that pirate world for a little while as well, haven't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Been doing that for phew, wow. So I started a pirate radio in. Um, I would probably get. I think about two thousand, two thousand and one would have been my first shows on pirate radio. Was back then in like South London on Desire FM and Two G FM. And a couple of guest slots on Delight, and then um, see all these names I remember because I as a during a time of, of doing the albums with Sony BMG and that, they always used to give me like an eighty pager of like DJs' names. Oh yeah, and different FMs and pirate stations. Back then it was just ridiculous how many people there were. You know, like we didn't have Twitter or Facebook or anything like that. So uh, no. it literally was local knowledge. Mm. Who you know, like people from different areas, literally giving you a list of the DJs. And if you had their contact details, which back then would have probably just been a phone number. Yeah. If, and if you're lucky, you had it. Yeah, exactly <laughs> that. And then the old, I suppose there was like mail out companies that would know where they lived. Mm. And then they could, like, you get records sent through the post and all that. Mm. It's starting to sound like a proper old man now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, it all begins like this. A lot of these, a lot of these sessions start like that. But it is a, there, is a, there was a little like warm place in your heart for that time, wasn't it? You yeah, know? yeah. It was different. It was a, an experience. I think back then, you know, a lot of the kind of wants and needs of an artist were a lot more simple. I was just happy to get sent records mm. and not have to pay for them. That was mm. enough for me. Yeah, that was a buzz. But uh, yeah, in terms of getting gigs and stuff, it was, uh, and even just like selling vinyl, selling records, you never knew if anyone was really like buying your stuff until it would take mm. it would take you like a month before. You mean, oh, so you might hear something on the radio, and then like a couple other, you might hear it a couple more times, and. You know, there was no route of feedback apart from the record shop phoning you up to tell you they need more stock. Yeah. So that was like the only way you knew if something was going well. Popping, whether yeah. It's com yeah, communication was minimal. Exactly, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And and everything was natural, you know. There was no, nothing got hyped up online. And then, you know, mm -hmm. until you was an established artist, no one was waiting for your music. Yeah, you just had to stumble across it in the shop. So, yeah, it was mad. Nice, isn't it? it really forced people to be proper DJs. Do you find like with... Like particularly with like your releases you've had in the past, with the with with now this kind of like common ground of people being able to communicate. I, I speak in person as well. The amount of times that I thought a record really did shit, <laughs> but then as soon as you post a flashback or a f throwback, yeah. all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, oh, that was that it. tune. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean it's mad? Everyone's got a little story behind um, a song, but I feel like as everything's become a bit more digital, maybe we lose in touch with that a, t a little bit. You know, some songs really like resonate with people, but on the whole, I think like from my own personal experience anyway, like my attachment to certain songs isn't quite as strong as it was when I had like a physical copy of it in my hand that I looked at every time I played it. And, you know, mm. 
it, it was all very visual back then, whereas now it's a little bit more like it's all like in your memory. You got to remember like when you where you was when you heard that tune oh, the first time, that kind mean. of thing. Yeah. Whereas back then, like the the memories were a lot more visual. There was an actual imagery like attached to the yeah. record. You know, like I find it very very difficult now to attach. Like me personally, I play on like Serato, so um, and the way that mine's set up, I don't see the the artwork attached to mm. any of the songs. So if I don't know the name of the song I'm looking for, it's hard to sort of spot it. Whereas back it's in the day, you yeah, like you yeah, you flick yeah. through all of the sleeves and you're like, there it is. But even you don't the, have that even the crust on the top of the vinyl. Exactly, yeah. You, you know what one. It, yeah, you're looking for something in the bag, but now it's a. Uh, you know what you're going for. You have to find like search for the word or. So the artwork's not attached. It's just the name and the mm. song and like unless the song's like, it's it's hard for songs to get. Ingrained in the memory as such, I think. Uh, for me, there are some. It's very very rare now that like, a song stays in your set for like a year or two. Because back then it was like there were certain songs that would be played. When you say constantly. back then, what, when what era would you say? I'd say like maybe like 10, 15 years ago. Mm. You know, when vinyl kind of like filtered out a little bit, at least in my case. Um, but there's still the dub plates for things. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. I was yeah. I mean, back then there wasn't the like. There's so much music now, and it's so easy to get hold of it, and it's hard now to keep up with yeah, for what's, real. what's coming out and who's got what out, and yeah. even just staying on top of like promos and stuff. You get sent like hundreds every week, it's and not, yeah. you can't physically go through all of them. Whereas back then, like when it was just records, the label, the record shop might only have like 10, 15 new releases each week. Mm. So like, if you go in there every week, chant, or or in my case, I'll be there maybe a couple of times a week. Mm. I might only have three or four new songs to listen to since the last time I came in. Mm. It was well easy to digest. And were you chasing those new? You, you knew you knew when. Yeah. The the, the, the delivery guy. Delivery yeah. Would come. Yeah. I'd wait, and then I got my one of my first jobs in the industry was in distribution. So I was at the end before it even got to the shop. Really? I was hearing stuff that was coming out in the next few weeks when we're waiting for the pressings to come in and stuff. Oh. So yeah, I think that's probably where my interest peaked a bit on like new music that's why it really i wanted to have have stuff first mm -hmm. i wanted to you know being on the radio at that time when you was working in distribution you got your hands on a lot of stuff that was not even pressed yet and mm. that was hard back then to get yeah. hold of it. So you had to be stuff. the first you know, yeah you were very much in the front line just trying to yeah like become friends with all of the artists that sent stuff in that was really good and then it was like getting into production myself was more just so i could uh get tunes off other people so i had mm. something to offer in return because people are much more likely to give you something exclusive to play if you could give them something as well yeah yeah it's interesting you say that a lot of artists i think f it, it's more about the given the the given return isn't it it's, um i i remember significant times in my career where i was just like hey you know what if i put out a rec a record like in a, in in a regular way, if I put out release a record, then I'll be able to do more shows. Yeah, do you know what I mean? And it's those, it's a simple like payoff of like, well, I do that and I get that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, I think that's just it's the survival. That's what I've always done, really. Like I always have like for me, like I like DJing, I like playing out. That's the most important thing for me. Like the production side of it's cool, but I don't really buzz buzz off being in the studio and writing a a song. I don't know. I've just never really been like that. I I like. I like writing music, but it I do it because I want shows. I want to be in the club. Mm. And um, yeah, like for me, production's almost like a vehicle to hopefully get shows. And go. I'm always thinking about, you know, like how can I like maximise the like, how can we make sure that the most possible people hear this? Mm -hmm. And now it's more about like timing and like, the working out the run up to it like make sure that you're posting about it on social media make sure your friends are like supporting it make sure DJs who might play it have got it yeah yeah you know like it's a little bit more calculated now yeah as before it was a bit like pissing in the wind you just mm. hope I hope this works I hope this does all right because mm. you didn't know you had no way of knowing because mm -mm. you, you just put stuff out because you thought it, it might it might sell mm. oh this this sounds a bit like that that's popping off like mm. if I put this out that might that might slot in with like people who are playing that kind of thing, mm. and uh, that was about as calculated as you could be. Just it was guesswork, mm. um, and there was nowhere to hype up your releases apart from a few magazines like Rewind magazine and stuff like that. But you know, like 
even getting into them were, was more like something you did when you become a little bit more established, unless obviously you were paying for it, which a lot of people don't realise that yeah. Rewind magazine, that's how it ran. Yeah, yeah. It was I like, think Touch magazine was a bit like yeah, that. Yeah, well, yeah. You, you kind of paid for a, like editorial right. space, like per, this site based on how, how many pages you wanted. Yeah. Even though it was an interview, you're still paying... Yeah. And they, you know, they sold the front cover. Like, and I think they kind doing. of carried that on into their online business as well, didn't they, a little bit? A little bit, yeah. And then I think they realised, you know, that blogs were already doing that for nothing. Yeah. And that killed that off pretty quickly. Mm. And then blogs killed off magazines pretty quickly after that. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, with what you were doing on the pirate, I mean, this is how I know you as. You're quite very much a tastemaker of of the, the genre, At, particularly like... Early doors grime, yeah. Do you know what I mean like with rinse and yeah. all the pirate stuff he was doing? Like, what were the what were the moments in in that that burgeoning scene that you'd be like, I didn't know he was gonna fucking be. Good. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, trying to think of like a real standout one that kind of just real popped off. Um, I mean. I remember, I remember being around people like N Type for a long time, um, mm, sort of meeting mm. him in the shops, just sort of like him being the face that sort of bump, would bounce in and out of the record shop. And he was a bit of a joker. He was a larger than life character, and he was just super eager to get on the radio and that. But like, given the sort of like the way you know, like he's he was so larger than life yeah, yeah, yeah. that he could never like. A lot of people didn't take him seriously, but he actually turned out that when people gave him an opportunity, he was actually a pretty sick DJ. So once he got his foot in the door, I would, like it wasn't like he blew up like a like a scream or a benga did or anyone like that, but he got he established himself in that dubstep movement very quickly. Once like he got his foot in the door, I people see. were like, "Oh, he's actually good. Give him a radio show. Give him that." And he sets his label up, and then he established himself nicely. So he that was one that, like uh, kind of once he got his foot foot in there that he established himself nicely, and then obviously yeah like scream and benga. I think. I don't think I was that surprised at them because I was playing a lot of their music myself, and then that's you know, your camp, man. When I yeah, think all the Croydon lot, Croydon, you, you're you're Croydon, aren't yeah, you? yeah, yeah. And but then like for me, like the sort of people that play my music were more based in East. Like a lot of the people that are playing the early dubstep stuff weren't that into what I was making at the time. And then it wasn't when I started playing at Forward in like 2003, I had to adhere my sound a little bit to the Forward crowd, which was more about like deep stuff mm. but i didn't really make that so i had to make like grime that sounded like it was structured that way and then that kind of opened the, a whole manner of doors for me because it, it then it became like it wasn't just about making instrumentals for mcs mm. all of a sudden like all these electronica heads were like into what i was doing because it was structured like a dance record and not like a basic instrumental for mcs because that's what i'm saying it's like you've got quite a broad palette and that's what i mean by tastemaker it's like you 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 garner a different yeah, I think Audience, I, in, isn't it? in the beginning, I don't think it was 100% like on purpose. Mm. I think it just happened that I was, I, I, in my head, I was like this grime producer. And then because I was in amongst all the dubstep lot in the early days, I was playing a lot of that on the radio. Mm. So I crossed a little bit into that. And because of my involvement with all of them, I was like well in with that camp. And that got me the gigs at like forward. Yeah. And then when you're at forward, you're thought of as like a dubstep DJ. But people who went to forward knew that. I, I didn't just play dubstep. I played a lot of grime and I played a lot of my own stuff, which f sat in the middle. You and then after that, that yeah. it was always like, oh, I quite like trying to find like a gap. Mm. So it was finding stuff that I liked and trying to find the middle ground between those two things. So I had like music in that space to play that would mix well between this song and that song. And that's pretty much what I've done ever since. I just, cool. like, <laughs> just like trying to, yeah, just trying to find your little gap mm. and... And existing in that gap for a little while until until a magnitude of artists join you in the gap, and that mm. is how genres start. I think like yeah, it not always is like a hundred percent on purpose or like calculated. It's just like if what you're doing resonates with enough other producers, then they'll try and emulate the success that you're having with said song that sits in between this and that. And then before you know it, there's twenty songs that sit in between this and that. And then you've got another little genre bubble in a way with like five to ten artists that are like making stuff that sounds like that. And yeah. then that ten turns into twenty and that twenty turns into sixty. Mm. And and then you, before you know it, you've got a global scene, which yeah. is what happened. And a club night. And, a, and a, exactly, and yeah, a labels and yeah. yeah, radio stations that are championing exactly. It's exciting, isn't it? And when you see the way 
grime, I mean, Lord of the Mic times and things like that. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of money going around. No, no. Everyone was just like living at home and stuff, like with their folks. And yeah. I think everyone was young as well, you know, like when I met most of them kids, I was still like in my teens. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then in my or maybe my early 20s, I started gigging with a lot of them. Mm -hmm. But by the sounds of it, you were doing it to, in terms of accommodating what you wanted to do by achieving, like like you say, the byproduct was the music. Yeah. But you essentially you were, you were just trying to lily lily pad. Yeah. Across trying to find your feet on like. Yeah, just land. trying to like, trying to yeah, just trying to like find my own spot. Like where did where did I make sense in this story? Like what, all this stuff that's being made. Where's my spot? You mm. know, I just wanted to have my own little. Uh, the thing, the sound, the kind of sound that I was good at. So I remember being around like 23 and yeah, I mean, there were so many people doing bits that were kind of like unique within the certain genres. Like even like you listen back to like Grime and people like Johnny Cash back then was making what he called Sublo and Wiley was calling his music Esky. That's and right. it was like, I was like, I want, I want my own Sublo or my own Esky. But I didn't know what to call it, but I was trying to make a sound that like I could really stamp and I remember sitting there thinking over and over like, oh, this is oh, like industrial do. grime or this is that. And it was just like quite embarrassing now. And I think back to like how desperate I was to like stake something. But it it was more about having the sound than having a like name and being like, oh, this is that. Yeah. But then as you've gone on, like down the years, I've like, come across loads of different sounds and that. And I feel like more recently they've been playing like, like the wave stuff, which which uh, start, it kind of like got its name maybe around 2014 and that was like one of the first ones after all that that kind of got something that finally attached it so a name that yeah. attached to it Fit. and uh yeah that's 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 been interesting to see where that's gone that's kind of you know like music genres now they don't stay pure for long because internet just blows things up mm -hmm. and then before you know it there's 800 producers trying to make that yeah. song but they're bringing 800 new um what's the word uh, influences mm -hmm. in so before you know it that sound that was this and sounded exactly like this and was a, a mixture of this and this is now a mixture it's of this and this and this and this and this and before yeah. you know it it sounds nothing like how mm. it was six months ago that's right and and that means that it's almost got a new audience in the space of six months from it completely different from yeah. the people that were into it six months ago it's like oh then, then people are bored of it now because it sounds like this and they're not into that, but the people who are into that mm. are really into it. So every scene has like this six to nine month cycle at the minute when it pops. It's got like, it's got about six months to kind of establish itself and solidify. And if it don't, it just melds into like a million other sounds. It's mm. mad. Do you think That's a lot of that? Me. No, this is, this is some, this is, I've got a couple of questions bubbling now, right? So do you think, when you throw out a genre like or something that could be defined as your own sound and you throw it out to i don't know for argument's sake your joe blogs and you've got uh, uh, 1500 followers but one of them followers might be somebody that's got 250,000 followers yeah yeah and you throw that john into that genre out into that world and that other guy sees it and then blows it up within his camp that 250,000 people all suddenly like yeah yeah subscribing that definitely happens to him. a lot that happens a lot mm. right um how do you like if you've got if because everyone wants the Timberland wants the Timberland wants the Eskew, mm. I think that's I think that's in an artist's DNA, isn't it? Like to have even from a bit other of ownership genres. on something. Yeah, yeah. you want to. I mean, I definitely do it beatboxing. Like, but do you do you think that that's do you think that's going to be achievable? And if it is, what other options are there to try and preserve? That's it? the hardest thing now. I think like. The internet's just such a big place that you're like, there's just so many fish in the pond. Like one one fish will make a wave, but by the time it reaches like the big fish at the other end of the pond, they don't know who started it. Yeah. And as much as you can go trawling through the internet to find like, it's so hard to find like the true origin of like said sound that came out of the internet because mm. it's such a minefield of sound and mm. influences as mm. well. Like you can start tracing them back three iterations like generations if you like and um before you know it you just lost you lost it's so yeah. hard where like scenes are not started in a physical position or place like they were back in the day yeah like little communities of people in like a town or yeah. like a, a club night or like a record a store a record anything, store yeah. or a tower block or just anywhere where we, it, 
you do see it occasionally, like, you know, with a, like Jersey Club and like footwork in Chicago and uh, like um, ballroom in New York and stuff like that. But it's, again, like when you look at those scenes, why have those scenes stood out as legitimate movements and you can look at footwork and say True, like yeah. it's got it has a whole aesthetic to it, it looks a certain way there's da- there's a dance that goes with it same with ballroom jersey club is very much like it was stuck in jersey for so long mm. and it wasn't until like you started hearing it creep into people like diplo's sets that people were like what's that and then like he like you say like they he pushed that to it, like they? bang like, yeah. all the suddenly all these people know what jersey club is Suddenly all these people know what Baltimore Club is. Suddenly all these people know, you know, like Drake just used um, on that last single that he had was like a, what's that? Um, oh, I forget what the what the sound's called, but it's very much a New Orleans club sound. Oh, I think I know the tune. Yeah, New Orleans Bounce, yeah, I think it's right, called yeah. Bounce Music. And no one would have known about no one, that. But all of a sudden yeah. Drake makes a song that sounds like it. Kind of co-signs it. And everyone knows, oh, that. And it happened, you know, when Drake co-signed Skepta, it blew him up. It's like... Mm. Again, it's that that one person has the power to like completely blow something up mm. now, and then it, it's just down to whether or not the 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 genre can like withstand the the explosion, mm. and also the artists involved in it don't get too ahead of themselves as well, because that can mm. that can deflate things quickly too. That's what actually that kind of leads me to what I was just thinking there. Um, a footnote: I was thinking, well, at what point? has a scene been blown up and when do you have I think drum and bass went through it as well do you have your knights of the table and they're not going to move like they, they're the people that kind of run the ship and I think with grime we, we all know that the yeah they're players. still the same kind of people that were doing it 10 yeah. 15 years and ago, rightly so because like you say they was all in the, the they were in East yeah, the whole yeah, time, yeah. living with their parents or whatever, you know? Like, w- when you've got people on such a high level and they ain't going to l- leave their position, what happens to the younger guys? Do you think they come through so easily? I think it's been a bit easier in recent times. I think for a long time it was hard, and I think that's kind of how Grime started because Grime has started out of a lot of kids trying to make their way in the garage scene. Mm. I, I, I was a garage DJ for years before like anyone would have heard me playing any grime music on rinse for example really was it I happening sh- back then could you would was it easy to be a gr- it, uh, like a it was just, dj no nah, it was hard to get yourself in there you know like mm. you'd be lucky if you got a little warm-up set somewhere um but getting into like the scene so mm. to speak it was a lot they're all a lot older they were a lot more you know like they'd been running club circuits yeah. for years being like promoters what we were saying yeah and back then like producing music you needed a studio you needed access to a studio right. you needed to know someone who could get you in there to like have a go if you wanted to learn yeah and then you know like we had like fruity loops happened and then all of a sudden every kid who can download files off the internet has the ability to have a go at making beats and that is how grime was born really that and you know like golden era dude yeah that was it it changed everything <laughs> yeah, and now dude, you know no Everyone has access to mm. music production software now, whether it's a cracked, even, you know, even full versions of c- computer software is like less than 100 quid and it gives you plenty to start with. Yeah, man. There's, there's countless YouTube tutorials that show you, you know, like if you really put some hours into it in the space of a year, you can be as good as anyone out there. It's true. If you've got the right ideas, you know, the techniques aren't difficult and to learn. And you think there's, put, there's enough um, gateways for like younger acts within that grime world still? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think mm. I think like the last few years we've seen acts like AJ Tracy, you know, Stormzy True, is an yeah. obvious one um, yeah. that have come through and literally completely bypassed everyone that came before them to have their own success. Do you think and Instagram plays a part? In yeah, that? it does. Yeah, yeah, all definitely. of it. All of it does. You know, like these days more than in, ever, yeah. your online persona is is almost as important, if not more important, more important than yeah. your music. You know, like if if you're a cool person to follow. If you look cool, if you portray this like image that kids want to like buy into, yeah. you know everything is everything you do is a part of your brand these days. Mm. If your brand don't look that cool, kids are not going to be that bothered about what you know, like following it's your true. every tweet. It's true. Your every release, they want they want to be the first one to retweet it. They want to let they want to be the kid at school that shows all their mates the new song that no one else has heard yet. Mm. And that's everyone wants to be first. Mm. And if 
if you can build yourself some kind of brand that everyone wants, you know, people want to be, it's like clothes. Like, so you want to, you want to be seen in these clothes. Mm. That's the clothes. That's the latest trend to be seen in. Same with music. Like young kids, it's like Grimes obviously seen it a lot lately. Yeah. It's like if you're into music that and now like drill music is like kids at school want to be the kid that knows the most about drill music, but mm. they're all, they're all on it. They all want to be the first. They w- and they want to do it as well. They, exactly. <laughs> and, yeah, and now they can because the access to the equipment is is nice and easy and cheap. Mm. Doesn't matter where you are in the world. No. It doesn't matter if you're a gangster or not. No, exactly. <laughs> you can fake it. Yeah. <laughs> fake it till you make it. Yeah, the virality on a lot of this stuff as well is just it's insane. Like, um, yeah. I think we're, we're lucky as, as artists to still be able to... I know, yeah. You know, keep doing what we're doing within, you know within the, the, the realms of that world. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, drill music. Um, I'm a fan of it. I, I, I am. I always have been that. You know, there's, there is a anti-establishment at stake, of course. Um, and then then YouTube starts policing. Yeah, that's... Well, that's some fucked up shit. Go. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a mess. Yeah. I think it's just like, you know, the government, the police, everyone's trying to find a scapegoat for what is obviously becoming a major problem in mm. the UK, the knife crime um, epidemic. Mm. We call it an epidemic. It, it is an mm. epidemic. It is a problem. But it has been a problem for a while. Um, I think that like it's just starting to hit headlines now. You know, like kids have been getting stabbed for yeah. years. Right. But all of a yeah. sudden, it's, it's reaching the headlines because we haven't got anything else to report about. True. But, yeah, you know, it's a problem. Like today, I had to call my missus because... I look on my Twitter feed and she's heading into Croydon this afternoon with the little one. And all on my Twitter feed, the Croydon advertiser, uh, parts of Croydon are shut because someone got stabbed this Aww. afternoon, like midday, broad daylight, in the middle of Croydon town centre. They've had to shut down. Daylight? Yeah, this happened today. And luckily, my missus wasn't in town then. She was on her way in and all the trams had been stopped and stuff. It doesn't beg thinking about, you know. I was just like, I hope she weren't there to see mm. it or like be near it. or yeah. It's horrible, but it's happening. It and happened to me, dude. It happened across the road. Oh, 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 oh. Um, DJ. I got m- held up at knife point, man. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's, it's mad. It's mad. You, crazy. And I was talking about it today to a few pe- people. And uh, when I grew up, it was kind of like, and it's, it's sad, like, I don't know, it's probably worse now, but for me, like, growing, like, getting mugged was part of growing up. Like, mm. I don't know anyone that lived near me that didn't go through it at least two or three times. Yeah, like, man. I remember doing, I remember getting hit off the uh, train, I, I think I was on my way to Brighton, and I was in one of those kind of family carriages, you know, yeah. the old school ones, and like a fall, it was like 9.30, and then all of a sudden, one way in, one way out, these kids are in. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But had I not done that, it's kind of part of the... You just, yeah, I mean, I think up, we're saying like, man, I, more than five times did I get like mugged in my like teens. By the time I was in like my, in my late teens, early twenties, I, I was telling them no. <laughs> I was like so numb to it by then that I was like, no. You can't do I this can t- to me anymore. I can tell you're not going to stab me. Yeah. And I don't think you're going to hit me. I'll take my chance and tell you you're not having any money yeah. and do one. But when I was in my teens, I was I was absolutely frightened, mm. like frightened, senseless of getting mugged, and like you could always tell when it was going to happen. You just became so accustomed to getting mugged or like having an attempt made on you mm. that you could see it coming down the road. You'd be like, "That guy's, oh, he's crossed the road. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely gonna. He's he's, he's looking at me. Yeah, he's coming here. He's on his way." Do you reckon it's just the kids then that are like? Uh... The problem is now these kids are still out there doing it, but they're tooled up. When I was right. like, it was rare that like you get mugged and you'd have a knife held to you whereas now i feel like it would be rare if you didn't have a knife pulled on you and that's the problem because yeah. kids have got knives pulled on them one wrong move they're gonna get cut and unfortunately that's happening it's i think it's just kids everywhere have got weapons like it's worrying mm. but the problem not coming from drill music, it's coming from way beyond that before it. Yeah, man, the drill music's the reports. Exactly. They're not the, they're, the, they're just the, they're the, yeah. you know, the if, vehicles. If their education was better and and there was more police and, mm. you know, that the, the, the police had a better, uh, like, relationship with yeah. local communities Communist, and schools yeah. and if they had the time to go into schools, like, I mean... I'm not sure. But I, I remember I remember police coming into our schools and teaching us about all sorts of stuff when I was growing up, but 
I don't know how often it's done now, given the cuts that they've gone through and all that. Like, mm. you know, there's loads of things you can talk about, loads of reasons, but I think drill's the last <laughs> reason. Know. It's not. It, it's definitely. It might. It might be glamorizing it in a in a slight sense, but um, it's not like it's not it's not the be all and end all of the blame. Mm. And I, think, I don't and they think they should be friending them up. They yeah. should be. I don't think I don't side. think turning it off of YouTube is is going to make any difference. Nah. It's not going to make a single ounce of difference. No. And I feel for the kids as well that are involved in that whole thing because nowadays the only portals in which people can look at their new music is YouTube. That's the only place where you switch that off and what have they got? Well, there's nowhere to perform anymore. No. Nah. And no club in their right mind is going to want a drill act to perform in there anyway because nah. then they're too worried about getting shut down by yeah. especially now they're not going to put drill nights on anywhere are they yeah, like just bad publicity all around isn't it the only place these acts are going to get booked is festivals and even the festivals now are probably looking at it thinking <laughs> we ain't getting involved in that like that's too yeah. much bad publicity for us and there's some f <laughs> awesome acts out there as well yeah yeah that's the problem you they're know? just going to be stifled like yeah. the only place you're going to hear them is on their twitter feeds yeah that's, that's it going to be it yeah that's it um let's double back on ourselves so Rinse FM, mm. that era of when uh, Grime was just popping. How I, mean, I don't know enough about Rinse at that time. Like, so when I first joined Rinse was 2003. And at that time, it was in um, a block of free, like the classic like free flats that everyone talks about. It was in there um, down in Bow by the, by the flyover. And it was in the block of flats there. It was I can't remember how many floors up, but it was quite high. I remember like the lift was broken most weeks. And you'd have to walk, and it was a long old walk up the stairs with your records back then. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was just in an old flat that had just they built a um, a sort of soundproof room inside the flat out of like MDF and all sorts of. It was like sawdust everywhere. Right. It was really hot. You had to close this little door behind you that was more like a hatch than a door. You had to kind of crawl in and crawl out. I've and seen video footage of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's, it was, yeah, I'm picturing it. Yeah, and so I started out there. I used to go on with Virus Syndicate who come down from Manchester. And then occasionally they couldn't make it, so I'd be on my own in there. Mm. And then I think Genius heard a, a couple of shows that I'd done because I was talking, like presenting what I was doing. Um, and at the time it was just crews and MCs and he was like, oh, we need someone who plays this music to talk about what it is. Mm -hmm. So they offered me my own slot earlier on in the night and they said, you can still go on with Virus later on if you want, but we want you to come and do that on your own wow. at like seven till nine with no MCs, just like talk Trains. about the records because no one knows what these records are called. Like oh. we said, we didn't have internet websites, nothing like that really yeah. apart from a few web forums. So just your average listener who's picked it up in the car or whatever has no idea what they're listening to, where they can buy the records, when it's out, oh, if it's released. It. And th that was it. Like, So that was my the show. John Peel. Of yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. John Real. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that, that, was, that was the beginning of my time on Rinse. And um, so that was the first studio. I don't think we were there for too long before it moved on. It was always get moved on. Every, every like, six months or so, it would, you know, the block would get a bit would become bait to like they would be worried of like the whole thing getting shut down the DCI yeah. making all of your equipment other people coming in and robbing everyone and that was a real thing you know back then other stations there was rivalry between mm. stations if, if if another station caught wind of where your studio was they'd come down rob everything rob everyone probably beat you up what? yeah wow. so, what, so, so literally it was like I never experienced it personally at Rinse but like in South it was a regular it, you know, I used to phone radio every week to check that it was on if, like, I turned the radio on and I couldn't hear nothing. And nine times out of ten, if it was off, it was because there had been some kind of beef or someone had got in the studio and nicked all the equipment. No way. Yeah. Wow. It was getting cut off, like, every few weeks at some at some point. That's crazy. Yeah. Rinse was a little bit different. I think, like, maybe Rinse had a slightly better... Um, security. <laughs> no, well, no, we had no security. That was another thing. It was scary as fuck <laughs> being on there, like late nights on Saturdays on my own when I was doing the virus slot, which was one till three. I remember coming out of there a couple of times and my car had been smashed into and what? yeah, there was like crackheads rolling around the, the the blocks all the time. Wow. It was, it was scary. Like me being like this short kid, like from 
not from around there either. Like, I did not know where I was. Like, because you're quite unassuming as a character. Yeah. I can imagine like you walking down, seeing your car. All like, I was, yeah, I just wanted to come do my thing. Yeah, but was very aware that like, oh, it's a bit, it's a bit hot around here. Like, yeah. keep your head down and just get up there. Don't hang about. Don't be on your phone outside. Like, just get up there, get out, get in your car. Wow, proper soldier, man. Yeah, what? it was proper. It was proper <laughs> raw. Like, yeah. Yeah, people from back then will tell you it was just not the place you wanted to be hanging around on your own on a Saturday night. But yeah, man. Yeah, it's weird. I don't know. Like, I feel like maybe we was a bit more fearless back then. But like now, if someone's like, "Do you want to come do a show?" Like, it's it's on this block of flats. It's ten f- floors up. Mm. Just let yourself in, and like the next DJ, when the next DJ gets there, just you know, yeah. let him in. Yeah, it's like leave. a given now, isn't it? It's yeah, like... I'd be like, no thanks, I'm all right. Oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do <laughs> it? I don't think I'd do it now. Oh, right. Okay. No, I think I'm. I've got too much to to lose now. Whereas back then, I was just like that. All I wanted to do was play on the radio. Now it's like, no, nah, it's all right. I'll just do a, I'll do a mix in my house instead. Or, yeah. I, you know, I'll just do a Facebook Live or... Yeah, well, you know the, what I mean? Yeah, it's just, you can put a mix up on SoundCloud instead rather than yeah. go through that. Because I don't think a lot of... The, I mean, there are a few pirates around still. I but I don't think they operate like that now. I feel no. like most pirates are more like internet stations that yeah. also broadcast on the FM. So they run a little bit more normally, you know, mm. like there's less, definitely less rivalry. Yeah. Um, it's a bit probably a bit easier to get on the FM now. A bit more space on the frequencies, yeah. But yeah, whether or not you'd bother going through that hassle to just be on FM with so many people listening to most of their radio online or oh, just downloading else, yeah. podcasts and stuff, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's where people do their listening. So, I don't think many people out there will put themselves through that kind of stress just mm. to be on the FM dial for the sake of mm. saying we're on FM. Yeah, it's kind of like, like like Radio Luxembourg back in the day, there's a there's there's always a risk to doing music yeah music in general is a dangerous sport and i think when you have like the danger mixed with the hardness of the music it's like a tension release and a reason why it's like yeah i guess back then i think it was like a big part of why people liked it you know the fact that they felt they were a part of something that not many people knew about with it being pirate Mm. you had to like trawl through the airwaves to find something that you like the sound of and then that was your station and you rode for that station like you go into college and people be like, oh, did you listen to so-and-so last night? It was like right. everyone was talking about it. If you had good enough reception, you had the tape and you're sat there listening to like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ear, ear, one ear buddy each and that, yeah. Totally, yeah. Sometimes it flick in and off of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those ones, yeah. Yeah, that's what, that's that's the rock and roll in, in that, that's the energy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's it was like, definitely you know exciting. Oh, yeah. To be able to get into that as well was, um, you had to know someone who could bring you in. And yeah, for me, it was just like meeting people at college and like bumping into old friends, like DJing at house parties and stuff. And they're like, oh, are you on radio? And you're like, no. And they're like, oh, you should come down here next weekend. Like come through and like, like come and meet the, come and meet the management and see if they'll give you a set or like, can you do a tape? It was, that was how you got in. Just like you had to know someone who could mm. like pass a tape on for you. So you knew people within like what the Croydon scene? Yeah, it was mostly like people I'd bump into at like playing at house parties or in the record shop. You know, they'll bump in someone and be like, oh, I, I saw you at that club the other week, like, blah, blah. Like, what music do you play? And then, like, you get chatting and, yeah, before you know it, oh, it turns out he's on the radio or, you know, like, people like Hatcher at Big Apple, we knew a few people on the station. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, it was just, like, meeting other people and talking about who they were and what they were doing. And, you know, if, if you became friends, they would try and bring you in on things and... Yeah, like you. Once you was on the station, it was more about like trying to get your mates on there as well. So, yeah. Do you think like in those environments? I mean, it sounds to me like a lot of opportunities were made. Um, some of them, by the sounds of it, in your journey, just happened by right place at the right time. Yeah, definitely. A do lot you, of it was that. Do you think? Do you think? Do you think at times you you kind of because you're still fucking you're so busy, you're still doing stuff. But in those days. Um, these informative years when you were just like happen to be bumping into these, do you feel like it's almost like mapped out? I always say to people it's important to get out to club nights and that if you're like trying to start out, just show your face. Like if you want, if you want to DJ at these club nights and stuff like that, there's nothing better than going down there and paying and like speaking to the promoter or like the DJs and just mm. saying like, oh, I'm, I make music or thing and I, I, I like I like what you guys are doing. Mm. Like here's a mix or here's some of my tunes like. Mm. that's still for me probably the best way in it's bet email is great but people don't how many people check every email they get sent not many but everyone will remember that guy who came up to them 
or that girl who came up to them at the club and says, here's my mix. Check me out. And like, I like what you're doing and I've paid to come in. Mm. Like, I'm supporting what you're doing. They'll remember that 10 times more than yeah. like, oh, I saw your email. Yeah, sorry about that. Like, yeah. It's always, it, it, you yeah. can bypass. Yeah, pe- people have got busy, people are busy in the daytimes. They're like, they're doing, mm. they're, they're like looking at spreadsheets. They might see your email pop up and be like, I'll check that later. Mm-hmm. 50 true. emails later, it's on another page. They're not even going to see it again. And they think to themselves, I'm going to listen to it later, but they never do. Yeah, that's the thing. And I'm I'm one of the worst culprits for oh, that. Yeah. Like, I'll get you. I get sent stuff all the time. And Me I, too. I ne- even from friends of mine, and I'm like, I'll see them like three days down. I'm like, mate, I saw your email. I haven't, I'm sorry, I haven't even had a chance to look at it yet. As a DJ, I would imagine that the intensity in which you get given stuff and, yeah. and the expectation, particularly on people that you might have known for a long time, to just ho- you to holler back at them. This is it. I always say to people to send me music on SoundCloud for that reason is because I can't be like tied into a mass email that's sent to 300 people if they send it to me on SoundCloud. Mm. Even if they've copied and pasted it to 300 people, they've had to individually go to each of those 300 people's SoundCloud message, open up new message, paste it in, yeah. and... If they took even taken that time, it means that they know that I might be interested in it. Mm. If you go through my email inbox, I get sent stuff like that I'm I'm not even interested in, like pop music, trance, like you know, like rock music, like stuff mm. that I don't even play. Don't mess with, yeah. and it's like I, so it just gets lost in amongst all yeah. of that. It just gets watered down to the point that like I'm probably not gonna. It's very rare I look at an email and I go like, oh, I must listen to that now. Even from people who I know, like I'll be like, yeah, in I'll check that later. Yeah. yeah um and in terms of like your set because when i i remember seeing you at brooklyn bowl mm. that's one wasn't it wasn't yeah it? brooklyn bowl yeah, yeah. in the o2 yeah yeah, yeah. it's a little while ago but i remember i totally remember me and my mate porch just like next to each other like <laughs> up in the grime yeah you know? and it was just like tear 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 like how far since then uh, uh, progressively like your set is it is it as mixed as it as it I think was it's then? probably like more now. Like I'll play loads of different genres when I play out. Um, also, been playing a shitload of like disco gigs lately, which started out as a bit of a laugh and started rolling more and more. Like people were actually more interested, and then the pro- and then the nights were busy, so mm-hmm. promoters will have you back again, and then it's busy again. So win win. And yeah. then it's like you're getting booked by them six times a year, which mm-hmm. is more than they'll book me to play like what you know like what I'd be playing on the radio or the kind of music I produce. Mm. So that's been a mad one. But um, yeah, in terms of like playing sort of bass music, it's definitely really varied. Um, I'm always trying to find stuff. It's a bit like what I was saying like earlier with like trying to find bits that fit in between the genres that I'm playing. Whereas mm. back then I was just playing like dubstep and grime. So everything was around 140 BPM. Now mm. I'll be playing stuff that like sits between stuff that sits between, that sits between, that sits between. So... 10 years down the line like the music's all over the place but it's still quite bassy and dark but it's like tempos tempos are like really like it can go anything from like 90 bpm up to like 180 and then back round again it's like really depends on the mood oh. and like my yeah like so the folders that i'll play out of have like 2000 tracks in them and i'll just literally go order by bpm and then order by key so like I look at my Serato yeah, and there's so you're like, not throwing people in shit. <laughs> like, uh, notes. I mean, it's it, it's kind of, but it's still like it's a lot. It, it's a lot smooth. The transitions are smoother and slower than like um, necessarily like banging stuff in. But if maybe I get up to like 140 and I'm playing more like grime kind of stuff and dubstep, then I'm like bang, quick, quick, bang, bang. You can bang them in super quick. You can really do that. But then if you're playing like slower stuff and it's really melodic and the atmospheric. The mixing styles, you don't really chop and f- drop bits in because there's not a big drop. It's like there's a there's a slow build and like that. You ha- that's how you have to mix it as well. You have to mix it like a long blend that kind of fades in and then is like really smooth and floaty. But then when you're playing like high energy, like high impact, you can mm. mix high impact, high quick tempo, quick impact, like bang straight in, choppy mixes. Get the next one in in the next couple of seconds and it's gonna like go off again. But when you're playing stuff that's like atmospheric and chill and that's more about the pulse and the yeah vibe. it's more yeah because it's keeping it like a constant kind of vibe and quite heady and yeah like it really depends on the overall energy of the music the sort of stuff that you're playing so my mixing style really can even in one set can really change in the course of like a couple of hours or something i noticed that 
and it's quite it, that's a rarity to find like a DJ like you say doing more disco related stuff yeah that's been you know purely I mean? like because of the bookings like so I've had to like make my gigs I've had to make my sets playing that stuff better so mm. I've where I've had so many gigs doing it I just got more and more used to mixing that kind of music and uh, using Serato you know like making loops on like instrumental parts of songs that like that would be too, horrible yeah. to mix and stuff otherwise so I still mix like I do any other kind of music but yeah, in terms of like, you're going to go out and hear like a disco set, but maybe you've never heard it mixed like... The way you would have Yeah, done. so I, mi I mix the same. It's still like constant. There's no fading bits in and out because there's beats all over the place. It's mm. still all in key and all in all the tempos are like mm -hmm. mapped out. And what was the first time when you did a disco set? How would that feel? Like, were you like, what? what? Um, do you know what? I've done a few just like, like joking around and they're like after parties and stuff. And I think that's how the bookings came about. It was like, oh we know you like playing that well, kind yeah, of stuff that, and yeah. i've done it on rinse at like christmas and stuff as a laugh like a christmas day i would play like 80s and disco on rinse and uh i'd done that for yeah. a few years so i think people knew that i knew what i was doing but there was no bookings i wasn't like asking for no. and then i happened to get one at best of all because um i was playing there anyway and uh nick catch dubs not nick catch dubs sorry nick hawks um had like his reach up like disco uh, stage there and he was like oh do you want to come and play like an 80s set and i was like yeah cool so i did but i thought oh, if i'm playing at like a festival like best of all doing that and it's on the bill and everything then i have to make sure it's on point mm. so i really worked that set out it was the first one that probably the first time i've ever like worked to set out mm. literally like i had notes like on a bit of paper like this is the order this is the kind of tempo, like, remember to mix at this point. Like, that's really awesome, it man. Out. It's so good to know, you know, like anyone that's checking it out and doesn't, you know, wants to get into the thing, to know that even the pros are just like, well, I've got to write this one down. I know? just, yeah, because I'd never mix music like that in public mm. before, like, mm. at a scale of, like, best of all, you know, like... It's a lot know, on your shoulders, man. Good Whoa. chance there's, a, like, five, six hundred people at that stage watching you. Yeah. And there was, there was a lot of people. So I'm glad I did it that way. Mm. But also that set got recorded and then ended up on SoundCloud and it went not viral, but like a lot of people listened to it and liked right. it. And before you knew it, that set, promoters heard it and promoters were like, oh, can, we'd love to book you to do that at our thing. And I was getting booked at like proper disco nights and stuff like that to do that kind of set. So over time, yeah, over time I just had to like make, I couldn't just play the same set. It mm. was like, well... I've got to practice mixing this stuff now so that like if I play out another set, it's not like the same set. So yeah. I just had to like get used to all the songs and like I was saying like go into certain songs that really didn't have any parts that you could mix and just even create a quick like eight bar loop on Serato so that when it gets to that part of the song, that just loops around instrumentally so I can mix something else in. Mm -hmm. And you know the time in which you've done that too. Yeah, so in, time, in terms of like preparing sets now, I don't prepare them like that but i'll prepare bits of songs so mm. that like when it, if i want to play that song out i know that when i want to mix out of it i just turn turn loop mode on when it gets to that part of the song it's automatically going to start looping that eight bars which is in instrumental and then i can just mix something else in like that my, I, I might see. have a loop at the on the intro of that next one so mm -hmm. i can loop for like they become your anchor points where you exactly, yeah where you know when you hit so to you that can transition marker. and it's still mixing and it's like it blends cool. in still but it's at least the structure of the record is suited more to like a dance music set than like mm. a lot of those disco records will have like no beats on the intro or like. But how would really you ever govern intro. the tempo or anything? Exactly. So you got like using Serato as well. You can see like you can see the rough BPM. I mean, I don't I don't have like grids locked in, especially with like disco and eighty stuff. Like it's yeah. not tight enough anyway. It's not created on drum machines, so it's all like all over the place. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's got, so you, it's just a metronome, isn't it? Exactly. You know? So like a lot of like the live band stuff and. St all that kind of stuff is like you just got to try and find like in in some cases the loops that i make are like literally four beats but like i'll find a really like instrumental part like a breakdown which just drums yeah. and i'll just loop that drum loop for a bit so that i can mix the next song in and find the tempo in and uh yeah like it's just evolved from that to now i think the folder i, I play out of those kind of sets is about 450 records deep now because i've just been doing it for you think three maybe four and mm, yeah, about four years now I've been doing those kind of gigs. And, uh, yeah, you just get used to playing certain records. You know where the, the bits are. So it's a lot more relaxed. I don't stress it. I'll add a few songs to that playlist every few weeks. I'll go digging around trying to find more. 
yeah. going like discogs or um youtube like just literally like digging around for like rare stuff and in some cases like you can get it on itunes or you know oh, that's like, cool, buy them man. online or if not sometimes yeah. i've had to buy records and rip them like so that i've got them in my serato mm. so yeah it's been it's been fun it's been no different to like a- any other kind of music that i try and like get cut my teeth into but it's been nice because it's been like a contrast from what i do mm. day to day like listening to really dark kind of like moody music mm-hmm. that's like the complete opposite and it is isn't it it's like yeah. but it kind of services you in different yeah. modes but it? it was the music that i kind of grew up listening to and that, that i had that my parents kind of had on in the house so it was just like ah. naturally like i already knew loads about that music very and, cool yeah, man. yeah it was just like that's I was just playing it because I liked it, mm. and it turned into gigs. And, and now, you knew it from your parents. Yeah, so and, and, and now I, and now I'd say I'm probably more busy playing those gigs than playing like bass music. What a turn of events, eh? It's mad, yeah. Things it's you mental. grew up with, but it's it's a, another part of that is down to like you know like London club scene um, being a little bit. There's less clubs now, and the mm. clubs that are around are like under pressure to like be busy and sell drinks, and obviously that kind of music. The good times. Everyone comes out. Everyone buys drinks at the bar. They're there yeah. all night. It's easier for promoters to get that in, and it's easier to get bookings doing that because yeah. more people are likely to book that. That's mm. just the way it is. It is, yeah. And I think with like genres like grime, um, the more heavier end of like rap and drill, and that, like, I think they, I guess, will eventually fall in line. I think grime kind of is already falling. Grime in line. for me has almost gone into more of a concert-based situation now as yeah. well. Like a lot of the grime gigs I get are more like festivals and like the occasional like playing in between like a couple of live acts, you know, like you, do, yeah. you don't see Skepta at a club night anymore. He's literally concert and or no. nothing or like, you know, like he's at the stage now where he could do stadium tours. He's that big. Like, yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, and who would have ever, ever thought it? Yeah, it's mad it's how mad. it all came about. But, yeah. you know, he's always had it in him. It's just now like his kind of talent was just realised by such a large audience. Mm. So, yeah, in terms of the kind of gigs playing that kind of stuff now, they're more of the things that I'm playing. Like, you'll be find yourself in between, like, a Skepta and, like, a gigs or something like that. Like, She's only good like for a, you. That's, that's great, yeah. You know I mean? Don't get me wrong. I, they're great gigs yeah, as well. But, um, but, yeah, it's very rare to find yourself in, like, a grime club night at the moment just because there's not so many promoters kind of doing that kind of grassroots thing. Mm. And that's where DJs used to, like, earn their salt. Yeah. playing that kind of music and and also like dubstep's definitely taken a little bit of an upturn and recently i've been playing quite a few i find like a lot more of the like bass music nights i've been playing are more like geared towards yeah. me playing like dubstep, dubstep stuff playing like some throwback sets i've noticed that circus are doing well for themselves yeah they seem to have picked back up again yeah. i noticed they did something in london the other week yeah, it looked Croyd, good croy dub did a massive one what was that a couple of weeks ago now and that was like 900 people sold out it was absolutely rammed they've got that box part thing going on haven't they the Croydon. Fox Park one. Is oh, that, that was um, in Croydon's thing yeah. with Rodigan and all that lot. Yeah, that that. I mean, they always do well as well. Yeah, yeah. What was it like when you being a kid from Croydon and you know when Skrillex is on stage getting his Grammy and like, I'd like to thank Croydon. Yeah, yeah. Know. What was the upshot of that? Was that just like were you just like what? Like I I knew him at that time and I know like I've met him a bunch of times before that and he's always been super like like nerded out by like meeting people the whole who thing, were there yeah. from back in the day. So it was not much of a surprise to me. It was it was really like appreciated. Like mm-hmm. I thought that was great that like on that stage he was amazing done that. Like he didn't yeah. need to thank anyone and he thanked Croydon like and the Croydon crew and it was like yes. that's like you we're on the Grammys man. Like <laughs> yeah, man. it might not be us collecting <laughs> that but like we've played a part in that Grammy yeah. being realised and a lot of people think that like all other original dubstep heads hate Skrillex, but it's it's not the case for nah. anyone that I know. Like, mm-hmm. I'm happy. Like, you know, he took a sound and he put his spin on it. Whether you like it or not, yeah. it's you know, it it was original at the time. A lot of people were making this kind of like chainsaw bass lines, but they were very like kind of dry. It would be like a, a beat and a bass, and he came out and put like all these crazy it's like true, man. Yeah, crazy right. like riffs and stuff, and it was quite original sounding at the time and. As soon as he started doing that, every every, every man was changed. trying to do it, and yeah, yeah, like fair play to him. Like, I, you know, he did no different to what I was doing, like taking some influences that I liked and trying to make something that sat in between. True. And he was like looking at all his dubstep stuff, and he's probably come in from like he used to play in a rock band, like a massive like emo band. So he's been in that pop world. He's seen this EDM thing. He's seen the dubstep thing, and he sat right in the middle of it, and it just went bang. It went absolutely it. crazy. Yeah. yeah. 
And yeah, that's no different to what a lot of us were trying to do for years. And he just like cracked it, you know. Mm -hmm. He just hit the right gap. I was talking about those gaps earlier. Like he found a gap. Mm -hmm. And then before you know, everyone wanted to be in that gap. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Big he, time. Yeah. <laughs> Like the gap well wasn't big me. enough. Yeah, the gap weren't big enough for the amount of people that, and that's it. Like that's how it kind of yeah. it popped quite quickly after that. Um, but now it's definitely seen a nice little resurgence again. A lot of good music, a lot of events popping up and yeah, interest. So yeah, I'm keen to see how that all progresses in the next year or so. I feel like could have a nice little resurgence there. Yeah, man. Some nice original music coming through again. Yeah, you got like people like Conrad, Cowboy, Conrad yeah, 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 and Funk it's doing really well. Yeah, yeah. Conrad's yeah, and it's also well. good to see like the the. The older guys jumping back on it as well. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's... Yeah, everyone's involved. It's, it's good. Yeah. It's good to see. It'll be interesting to see how the next sort of six to twelve months pan out. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. All to play for. I'm a I'm a South boy actually. I'm from uh, I'm from Crawley. Oh right, yeah, a bit I'm further south, south from yeah. Croydon. Yeah, yeah. down so, near Gatwick Airport. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Way south. That kind of that kind of the chode of the south between like <laughs> Gatwick and Brighton. We're yeah. right in the middle. Yeah, but, but yeah, man. So yeah, when when he shout out Croydon, I was like, yeah, that's mad, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah that's good. That's no, good. it was good, mate. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely went down. Definitely went down well with the Croydon. Not sure of that. Yeah, you know it. No, Big I up didn't. Croydon crew every time. Yep. Man, like plastician inside the place. Thanks for coming down. Man, mate. thanks for having me. Thanks for the Enlightening beer as man. well, dude. Come, yeah, it's been fun, time, man. Yeah, definitely. Been Big a bubble. Up. Thanks for listening. Yeah, man. Killer Keller podcast. Stay lucky. Stay out of trouble. All right. Next time. Peace. Nice one, man. How's that? It went so quick. Big up for that.